last lesson, we learned that God, when he made the new covenant, he constituted the first covenant an old one, an old approach to him, an unacceptable approach to him. Man may no longer approach to God on the basis of his personal achievement. He must come to God on the basis of Jesus Christ's achievement and his alone. We learn that you cannot have two differing orders simultaneous at the same time. They cannot be preeminent at the same time. You cannot approach to God on the basis of law and the basis of grace simultaneously. You must abandon the old way, the old path to God, where salvation is your responsibility, and you must accept the truth that salvation has become Christ's responsibility, and your responsibility is to receive His salvation and to purge from your life everything that is contrary to it. Now today we want to deal with the truth of the ministers of the New Testament, those that bring it to us. It's vital for us to know the manner in which God deals with men. It is God's manner to deal with them upon the basis of a covenant or an agreement, a divine commitment, if you please. Now this is a refreshing view, that God deals with me upon the basis of a divine commitment. He tells me ahead of time what he's going to do and makes a commitment to me that on the basis of my faith and my conformity to his will, that he will, he will fulfill his commitment to me personally. Now this is illustrated at least three different places in Scripture. One is with Noah, the man who was perfect in his generation and found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It is said two places in Genesis 6 verse 18 and Genesis 9 verse 9, God said, with thee will I establish my covenant. I will establish my covenant with you. Remarkable. The God of heaven establishing a divine commitment and agreement with a mortal man. But that's the kind of God. God is. God does this. God is not standing off in heaven aloof from men. He is actually making an agreement and committing himself to mankind. Abraham, the father of the faithful, also experienced this. In Genesis, the 17th chapter, in verse 7, God said, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee. That's our God for you. I want my, my benefits to come to you, God is saying to Abraham. I am committed to blessing you, Abraham. My covenant is with you. With the nation of Israel in Exodus, the 6th chapter, Verse 4, and again in Leviticus 26, verse 9, God said, I will establish my covenant with you. Now my point in bringing this up is that God establishes his covenant with people. And in Christ, he has established a unique covenant with mankind. I will write my laws in their hearts and put them in their minds. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people and they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. What a commitment. And it's been made with men, not with angels, with men. Not with Michael, not with Gabriel. With men it's been made. Mankind, shall I say. This is more in keeping the covenant in Christ Jesus with God's eternal purpose. God's eternal objective has been to bless man. We've seen that throughout this series. It was found in the Abrahamic promise that God is committed to blessing mankind. The only thing that prohibits that blessing from occurring is man's obstinance and refusal to believe the record he's given of his son. <clears throat> now when we talk about the ministers of the New Testament, we are referring to a text in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter and verse 6. Here's how it reads. Who hath also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The point is this. It is not who ministers, but what is ministered. Now notice, he did not just say he's made us able ministers. That would have focused the spotlight upon them. He said he's made us able ministers of the New Testament. That focuses a spotlight on God's commitment. Incidentally, we ought to say here, particularly if you have ever been tempted to be an opportunist in the kingdom of God, the gospel will not make a celebrity out of you. The gospel will not make a person famous that ministers it. The gospel makes God famous and makes Jesus famous. When the gospel is preached in all of its pristine power and glory, 
What it does, it focuses the spotlight on Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who has taken away the sin of the world and lifts the spotlight away from mankind. The spotlight on mankind is not, as you must know, a lovely picture. Now this text is not limited to the apostles. They are not the only ones that were able ministers of the New Testament. We know this is the case because the work continues today as well as in the apostolic day. We read in Romans the 10th chapter, verses 14 through 17, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how can they call on him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher, the text says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the work of committing the New Testament to mankind is still here. And there still must be able ministers of the New Testament, men who make it accessible to men, who set before men the glorious benefits and promises of God. The achievements of the Lord Jesus Christ are presented to men by men. We also know this is true from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 18 and 21. There it is declared that God has ordained by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Somebody has to preach it. Someone has to declare it. God is not going to split open the heavens and shout down the gospel to mankind. He's not going to send an angel to preach it. He is not going to raise a dead man to preach it. It's men that must preach the gospel. They must be ministers of the New Testament. <clears throat> now, an able minister of the New Testament is someone that uh, is blessed with more than mere training. We do not deprecate training. You ought to hone up your skills, particularly if you're going to represent the Lord. God is not glorified by ignorance, slothfulness, and a lack of responsibility. But men become able ministers by more than just being trained. There must be insight into the message. You must only preach what you know. Limit yourself to that. What you've perceived, what you've understood, what you've comprehended. Now there are three texts in John 14, 15, and 16 that emphasize this. Here he's talking to the apostles, but he, he enunciates a principle here that is applicable to our day. In John 14 and verse 26 he states, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Again in John the 15th chapter in verse 26, Jesus comes over this principle again. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. One more text, John the 16th chapter, verses 13 and 14. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He that he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now we take all those texts and compress them together, understanding that the apostles were the foundations of the church. They received a unique measure of the Holy Spirit and unique insight into the message. They stand above and behind, above and apart from the rest of mankind. But this, this uh, still is true of all God's ministers. They must have insight into the gospel. And it is the Holy Spirit that opens this up to your understanding. He shows this to you. Or to put it another way, He causes it to make sense in your mind so you can correlate the gospel with man's need and man's responsibility. There are some other responsibilities that ministers have. Things that make them able ministers of the new covenant. Now they are opened up for us in the uh, sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians, and there are a variety of things here mentioned. Let me go over them. These things make a person an able minister. Now notice, our text said God hath made us able ministers. It's not enough just to be a minister of the New Testament. It is necessary to be an able minister of the New Testament. Your reaction under pressure will determine your ability to be a good minister of the gospel. Minister is someone who serves the gospel. Minister, I'm not speaking of minister as an official position in the church. Minister is a servant, someone who serves, makes accessible to men the New Testament, brings it within their grasp, 
makes it plain enough so they can associate themselves with it. Your reaction under pressure will tell whether you're able or not. In 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, where he is talking about them being approved as good ministers, verses 4 and 5, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. All of these were difficult circumstances. They were things none of us covet, none of us want. You do not go out of your way to experience these things. But in the work of God and in the work of the kingdom, as a matter of fact, in the normal crucible of life, you encounter these things, these difficult experiences. You approve yourself as a minister of God by your reaction under these circumstances. If difficulties call, cause you to fall apart, you must step back and refurbish your soul and become strong in the Lord and able to resist these things before you can be an able minister of the New Testament. Let's take another view. Righteous integrity is absolutely imperative. Verse 6 tells us, By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by love unfeigned. That's personal. Righteous integrity. If I might state it this way, God must be able to trust you with the gospel before you can be an able minister of the New Testament. Legion is the name of men who have represented God, who have brought personal reproach upon Him and upon themselves by their conduct. Seek to avoid this. You can if you're in Christ Jesus. You must personally participate in the benefits of the covenant if you're going to be an able minister of it. If you're going to tell people the truth about what God has for men, you must first have tasted of it yourself. James said the husbandman must be first partaker of the fruits. You must have experienced the things you say are available to mankind. Here it is in verse 7. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. We personally appropriated these things. We know what it's like to be upheld by the power of Almighty God. We know what it's like to be armed with righteousness on the right hand and the left so Satan cannot penetrate us with his fiery darts of temptations. That qualifies you as an able minister. And one last group of things here. The reaction of heaven and earth to you is imperative to be acceptable as an able minister. Here it is, verses uh, 8 through 10. By honor, that's heaven, by di and dishonor, that's earth. By evil report, earth, and good report, heaven. As deceivers, earth's view, yet true, heaven's view. As unknown, earth's view, yet well known, heaven's view. As dying, earth's experience, and yet we live, heavenly experience. As chastened, what happens on earth, and not killed, what happens in heaven. As sorrowful, earthly experience, yet always rejoicing, spiritual experience. As poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. You see, this is uh, uh, contrary reactions to you by heaven and earth. If there's a wide enough difference between God's view of you and earth's view of you, chances are you're on the right track. I commit those things to you. It's not just transmitting a message. It's not memorizing the liturgy. Memorizing something that's said and then passing it on. It's transmitting a message that has been discerned and personally appropriated. And may I say this, this message of the New Testament is discernible and it can be appropriated by the grace of God. Now the new covenant is ministered, it is served, it does not come by divine appointment, it does not fall on people's head out of heaven. It does not happen when you stumble over a chasm and suddenly God reveals it suddenly out of a set of circumstances to you. It is served and made available to you by men. Now let's step back and look at this New Testament once again. What we have in the ministration of the New Testament to men is a unity of heaven and earth. Earth and heaven are working together in the salvation of men. Hebrews the 8th chapter and verse 2 says of Jesus Christ that He is a minister of the heavenly sanctuary, which the Lord pitched to not men. So He's ministering from heaven. He's doing from heaven what can't be done upon earth. 
He's making accessible from heaven what cannot be made accessible on earth. Salvation does involve heavenly activity, but it involves earthly activity also. Let's turn to 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, and verse 6. And here we, we find Timothy called a minister. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. He's called a minister again in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 2. A minister, that we have a minister in heaven, Jesus, and ministers upon earth, holy men of God. Salvation involves heavenly and earthly activities working together. An able minister is someone who's in league with heaven, someone who's in harmony with heaven, someone whose ministry does not conflict with Jesus' ministry. Well, may I ask you this? Does your ministry conflict with Jesus' ministry? Are you working with Jesus or against Him? If you're working with Him, you are an able minister. Heaven and earth working together in harmony. What a remarkable thing. As the scriptures say, laborers together with God. Now participation is integral to the new covenant. I trust that you've been able to see this. Mankind becomes a part of this. There are ministers that God has given to every man. The scriptures say this in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 5. Who is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord hath given to every man. Now he's not only given us Jesus, who's in heaven, a minister of the heavenly sanctuary, he's given us earthly ministers, servants who minister to us the New Testament. <clears throat> now the apostle says, we not only minister the New Testament, we minister the spirit and not the letter. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. Like man, words have both form and content. They have both body and life. You will recall it when God made man, he formed him of the dust of the earth, but he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. So Adam consisted of a body and a soul, an external and an internal. Words are the same way. Words have a shell, that's their presentation. The milk of the word it's called in Hebrews the sixth chapter and the fifth chapter. Uh, but they have content, they have power also. The information of Scripture is the form or the body. The significance of Scripture is the content or the life, the thing that makes it profitable to God's people. Now Jesus revolutionized speech by putting life and vitality into it. <clears throat> he said in John 6, 63, The words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life. They have life-giving vitality. They're able to make a person suddenly come awake to God and to the things of God. If you will listen to Jesus, if you will listen to the words of commitment that he brings you from his heavenly Father, if you will listen to the gospel intently with your ear, they will make you come alive. Let's put it in words of Isaiah the prophet. In Isaiah 55 and verse 3. And they are startling words. He says, hear, and your soul shall live. That's what James meant when he said, Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save the soul. There is actually life imparting ability to the words of God. Now what Paul is saying is, he's saying we're able ministers of the New Testament. And when we preach to you, we're just not giving you a set of words. We're not just giving you a historical set of facts. We're not setting before you some rudimentary academics about the kingdom of God. What we're telling you is the truth. And the Holy Spirit working in league with us is revitalizing your spirit and making you come alive unto God. So the new covenant is not just merely a transmittal of information. It's a transmittal of reality. There's a body of reality that supports this message. Paul put it this way in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5. He says it's not in word only. Not in word only. That's the same thing as saying not in letter but in spirit. Able ministers of the new covenant. Again, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 20. The Holy Spirit witnesses that the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. Now not in word means not merely in word. It's not merely a set of lessons, not merely a set of rules or laws or regulations. It's in power. God's Word has been tied to things that really do exist. See, the Gospel proclaims God. God really is. The Gospel proclaims Christ. Christ really is. They're real persons. 
It proclaims heaven. Heaven really is. It proclaims a hope that's in heaven that really does exist. It proclaims a forgiveness that has really been wrought and that invests it with power. If there was no supporting reality behind the gospel, if it was just a philosophy of man, just some message that they told, it would have no life imparting power. But bless God, it's not just a philosophy. It's not just a way of life. It's not just a set of rules and regulations. It's the transmittal of things that really are, that God is and Christ is and forgiveness and salvation is and the hope of heaven is an able minister of the New Testament is someone that communicates that message to mankind. The Word of God, because of this, is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. Acts 20 and verse 32. Sanctified means fit for God's use. If you'll believe the gospel and receive the truth of His Son and receive remission of sins, you may not think this is true, but it is. God will use you in His kingdom. You see, because it's joined to vitalizing reality, the gospel transmits a message of a living God, of living bread, of living water, and a living hope. <clears throat> now, the new covenant is not ministered to men by means of a cunning presentation. It's not a fine art of salesmanship. The emphasis in being an able minister of the New Testament is not the technique that you use. Now, we do not deprecate you honing up your skills and presentation skills of the gospel, but they at no time must become preeminent. There are several ineffectual means of communicating the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 17 talks about the wisdom of words. This is an ineffectual means of transmitting the Word of God. You cannot convince people just by cunning words and salesman-like techniques. This is not what does it. In Romans, the 16th chapter, in verse 18, the apostle refers to fair speeches. Now, fair speeches will not do it either. They are not what makes a person an able minister of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, in verse 9, there were strange doctrines. Doctrine means teaching. That is, teachings that weren't compatible with truth. They may have sounded good. They may have sounded attractive. They may have sounded acceptable. The person may have put them across very ably, but there was no eternal realities that supported them. And because of this, they, did, they were not able ministers of the New Testament. I think I'd like to read Colossians, the second chapter, because he deals with it here, this uh, fact of a lifeless way of transmitting the truth. Colossians 2, verses 20 through 23. If ye be dead with Christ, if ye be dead with Christ, from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. <clears throat> the meaning of this text is simply this. There are two approaches to religion. One is set forth a set of rules and regulations that discipline people into walking in an acceptable manner. Give them a list. Tell them what they can do and what they can't do. Now this has a show of wisdom. It looks smart and it looks wise. There are many innumerable churches and groups and teachers and sects and cults that have employed this technique that have urged upon people to just follow this routine. This is our particular and peculiar routine. Follow this and you'll be acceptable. But there's one thing they don't tell you. In the words of the King James Version here, it says this is not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. In our language, what this is saying is this. This will not enable you to subdue your fleshly inclinations. The things you want to do that are wrong, the inclinations toward unlawful things, this will not, this system of regimentation will not cause that to cease. It will not make you accepted to God. God's not looking for people that simply do the right things. What God is looking for is people that want the right things, that long for the right things, that have a preference for the right things. And where these people are found, He will be able to work with them. He works with people like that. 
Now, the new covenant is designed to make you that kind of person. And if you hear the gospel enough, long enough and clear enough, and you do not resist it and you do not put it from you, what will happen is you'll want these things, and that's the prelude to receiving them. The power of the truth does not lie in its presentation, but in the reality that supports the presentation. That's what gives it the power. So it's not enough to educate men's minds with religious ideas and inform them of sacred duties. Paul is contrasting the vitality of the gospel with the lifelessness of the first covenant. He said, we're not ministers of the letter, but of the spirit. We bring the real life-giving substance to men. That's what the gospel does. Now the law, or the Old Testament, or the first covenant, all of them speaking of the same thing, it had a small measure of spirit. The bulk of it was letter, information. Even if you compared your Bible, if you take Genesis through Malachi, it's roughly 80% of your Bible. And if you take Matthew through Revelation, here's a little comparison. It's about 20% of your Bible. The bulk of the law was letter. The minority was spirit. But listen, in the gospel, the bulk of it is spirit. And the minor part of it is letter. Perhaps you've wondered why God didn't have the answers to all your little dilemmas in what we call the New Testament. Why the apostles didn't give spelled out answers for everything. There's a reason why. The reason is this, the bulk of it is spirit. And if you can get hold of what the apostles meant in the gospel, you will be able to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. The, our obligation is to, lay, is to lay before men the fact that discipline, regimentation, doing things the right way is not the emphasis of the gospel. Now let no one misunderstand me. You are to do things the right way. You are to labor to do this. But what makes you accepted with God is you receive what God received. God saw the travail of Christ's soul and was satisfied. An able minister of the New Testament is one who after he has participated in it is able to make people satisfied with Christ also. <laughs> 